Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back uh, to this afternoon's uh, session, first session um, on Saturday of the Halifax International Security Forum. Um, welcome to everybody, to the respected senators from the United States, to Minister McKay, uh, to the Canadians, and to people from all over the world who've come here. It's a great pleasure for us to welcome uh, Defence Minister Ehud Barak uh, from the State of Israel, formerly, of course, Prime Minister of the State of Israel, and one of the country's greatest statesmen of uh, the modern era. Um, this is going to be a 30-minute interview um, directly between myself and Mr. Barak. And following that, there will be an almost seamless web, at which point uh, Senators Udal and McCain will come and take more or less the same seats and continue uh, the discussion and broaden it out, and perhaps responding to some of the thoughts that have been raised uh, in our interview uh, just now. So welcome, Mr. Barak. Thank you for coming. Um, this morning's sessions have been dominated by, largely dominated, the first two sessions at least, uh, by events in the Arab world, which we have come to call the Arab Spring. Um, personally, since I, my early years were, my early adult years were heavily concentrated in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, uh, I was skeptical about this this phrase, the Arab Spring, because the Prague Spring, as anybody knows their European history, uh, ended with the Soviet invasion in August of 1968. Um, perhaps we ought to be more careful with the kind of nomenclature we use. For the State of Israel in particular, there are enormous ramifications any time there's change in your region. I wonder if you could just open the discussion uh, by giving a sense of how Israel understands the changes whether it sees it as an opportunity or whether it sees it as a combination of opportunity and great danger? Uh, it's too early to pass the judgment. We, clearly, we are clearly modest enough to understand that these developments are beyond our control. We do not pretend to have uh, any real leverage on it. It's something that we have not witnessed in the Middle East since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire some 90 years ago and in first sight, it's extremely moving, almost inspiring to see a whole Arab people standing on their feet, demand basic rights which are taken for granted in this part of the world. Uh, but uh, thinking about it more closely, it's clear to us that however visibility is low, the short and midterm will be extremely tough. You cannot predict exactly what will happen, but you can know for sure what will not happen. No, in no place in the Arab world a Jeffersonian democracy will emerge. No place in the Arab world a intellectual or moral beacon like Václav Havel will take over. And there is quite significant risk that some, at least some of the societies will be taken over by uh, organs like the Muslim Brotherhood, which are better deployed and probably more determined to to come to power. And so we don't know what will, what will happen. You know, a person cannot choose his parents. A, a nation cannot choose its neighbors. They, they are whoever they are. We are living in really a tough neighborhood. I once called it a villa in the jungle, probably a, an oasis in the desert is more proper description. Uh, we, we enjoy quite high quality of life not free of problems within Israel. We are strong, we are quite self-confident. We are the strongest country from Tripoli in Libya to, to Tehran, including, including Tehran. But we still do not pretend that we control it. We have to wait. There is one lesson that could be drawn, that a moment of truth, you can find yourself quite uh, um, compelled to take decisions on your own. And if you just look at the experience of some of the uh, autocratic leaders of the Middle East, uh, there is certain sense in this conclusion. There's a, there's a line much beloved of people in the defense sector, which is uh, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Uh, and with the kind of analysis that you've opened with about the potential dangers that you effectively rule out the possibility of a Jeffersonian style democracy that Egypt isn't going to turn into Denmark. Uh, you know, uh, Libya isn't going to become the United States of America. With that kind of analysis in mind, presumably your 
strategic thinking must have changed quite radically since the beginning of the Arab Spring, your preparations as to how you deal with potential threats. Can you give a sense as to the thinking, and perhaps the, the, the logistics might be asking a little bit too much, but the, certainly the thinking in terms of how you reorient your defense strategy to accommodate these kind of changes? We never deluded ourselves that we can predict what will happen, so we are trying to build our security defense structure based on an uh, extremely flexible uh, structure of forces. We try to learn quickly from experiences, however modest in, in size, so we uh, made a huge effort in uh, anti-terror and counter-insurgency uh, operations. We share even some of our knowledge and experience with many uh, of the allies who are now fighting in Afghanistan. We made a major effort into the UAV area and standoff highly precision munitions about a generation ago when I was still in uniform, uh, just predicting that the issue of losses, the, 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 the death toll of a major conflict will become more and more central to the way that our societies are uh, uh, taking war and how far they are ready, to what extent they are ready to go, even for uh, extremely important issues uh, once the uh, body bags are coming from the uh, front. Uh, we, we enjoy being a very small country. We enjoy the capacity to move within internal lines, uh, our forces, so we are more flex flexible in a way, and we know exactly where we are supposed to fight it. We, we do not prepare ourselves to fight in the Antarctic or, or in Afghanistan. We know that we will never be there. Uh, so we, we enjoy certain advantages, but having said that, we are facing the same challenges that uh, Peter McKay faces here and, uh, and uh, John McCain and uh, Udall are facing in the Senate uh, committees, namely uh, budgetary constraints. We have to become more and more cost effective in terms of uh, flexibility and accuracy and lethality of whatever we, we employ. But strategically speaking, I still believe that we have an interest, because we do not control what will happen tomorrow in Syria, or next week in uh, Yemen, or, or, or even uh, be between uh, the PA and Hamas, uh, at, what play, at what step or what uh, phase uh, the PA in Ramallah will be able to coerce Hamas into accepting the basic rules of the game of the Middle East, namely recognizing Israel, leaving behind terror, uh, agreeing to all previous agreements that had been signed between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. We cannot predict. So we, I believe we have to try proactively to reduce tensions wherever we can, be it with the Egyptians, with the Turks, with however, to keep the uh, peace with Egypt, the peace with Jordan, uh, as far as we can, untouched, and focused on the main issues. You cannot uh, deal with all challenges simultaneously together, and leave those who should be left to their own fate uh, to be there, like uh, Assad at this stage of his career. <laughs> It, it, it was one of the interesting, um, we'll certainly come on to Syria, and uh, perhaps, perhaps as a bridge to the Iranian question, which I want to come on to in a, in a few moments. But How comes you're interested in Iran out of all the issues? <laughs> we have the sense that the Israelis have a certain perspective on Iran, but maybe we're going to find out we're mistaken. But just before we do come on to that, it's obviously a vastly important question. There was a school of thought, uh, particularly in Europe, but not only in Europe, about the problems of the Middle East, which effectively posited the notion that it's all about the Israel-Palestine conflict. And yet the, the evidence that's been presented by the, the, the train of events of the Arab Spring was that Israel was, was simply absent as an issue for these countries. And yet, given the, the potentially the negative, pessimistic scenario that you opened with, and also some of the people in the discussions earlier today raised the idea that it's, it's one thing to start off with a revolution, but if you can't deliver materially to your people in a certain 
reasonable time frame. There's a danger of a backlash. And I therefore wanted to put to you the, the, the question as to whether there's a, a real fear inside Israel that if things do go wrong in the Arab Spring, that the old, the old anti-Zionist rhetoric that's deeply embedded in terms of the political culture in many of these countries could be used as a rallying cry, and that therefore you face a very dangerous situation if things don't develop as hopefully as one might want them to. I fully agree with you that uh, the Arab Spring, as we call it, uh, is an opportunity to realize that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict had never been the real reason on the, on the uh, kind of causal chain for uh, whatever happens in the, uh, in, in the Arab world. But we cannot deny that it is used as an excuse to uh, mobilize energies to respond to the uh, calls from the street to take political uh, gain or create political uh, advantage by using the animosity against Israel and, and the America. It's an irony of the whole picture, you know, it's uh, in the autocratic Sunnite regimes, somehow the uh, leadership was very close to America, the peoples were anti-American. Uh, the opposite happens in Iran. Somehow the uh, regime is extremely anti-American. It seems to me that the people like the American, uh, the, the people like the American way of life and everything that comes with Moderna. I, I think that it's clear now that the Arabs has much more profound issues to solve within their own societies among themselves. But I should admit that uh, moving forward with the two states for two peoples solution, trying to find an opportunity to initiate a, a genuine negotiations with no preconditions and leaving behind the tendency to drift into a blame game, who, who is responsible for failure, rather to try to concentrate, be realistic, uh, supporting developments on the ground that are in the right direction, and even May I say, it's important that we will concentrate on, on the issues in a way that will, will take into account the possibility that we cannot achieve a fully-fledged agreement right now, and still it's our responsibility to see what can be achieved, probably in a phased uh, uh, process through different steps, well, what could be achieved right now should be achieved. We probably will have to leave certain issues for coming years, probably trying to shape the time frame and basic uh, conditions under which the continuation of process uh, will, f will follow. That's, that's what I believe we have to do. We have, it's not a zero-sum game between us and the Palestinians and our government, which is right-wing government, basically I'm the most centrist or the only one uh, center or left of the center in the government, but this government, however right-wing, so to speak, took upon itself a commitment to, to follow on with two-state solution with ne through negotiation, Israel side by side with the demilitarized Palestine living together. We need an answer for our uh, security consideration for obvious reasons. I was the prime minister who ordered total pullout, full pullout from Lebanon to the last square inch. We are now having 45,000 missiles and rockets covering all Israel that already had been used uh, once against us. Uh, Sharon, out of all people, toward the end of his career, made his gallant U-turn, decided to pull out from Gaza Strip. Last square inch, last settler, last settlement. He destroyed synagogues and took out uh, bodies from their graves to, to move uh, whole graveyards into Israel, just in order to leave no excuse for violence from the Gaza Strip. Nothing could be. And within a year or a year and a half, Hamas took over. Now they have 8,000 uh, missiles and rockets cover Israel and are used. You know, since I left Israel four days ago, four and a half days ago, there were two or three incidents of shooting indiscriminately into civilian population of Israel, and I ordered some responses, which always are so cautious not to cause any collateral damage that, you know, it's, we cannot accept it. We cannot accept this dual 
situation where we are supposed and trying to negotiate with Abu Mazen, with Fayyad, with uh, I see Mr. Shtia and uh, two ministers here, or the Palestinian Authority, but at the same time Hamas, which is not coerced into full compliance with the rules of the game in the, in the world, uh, is, uh, could become a partner for a unity government. That doesn't make sense. Again, <clears throat> pulling out to the, the wider region and then therefore potentially the impact back into the, uh, the Israel-Palestine question as such, Syria specifically has been one of the issues that we've discussed today and obviously for obvious reasons. Um, from the Israeli perspective, what do you think is going to happen in Syria? So from the Israeli, I'm looking at it from a broad the way that okay. you are, closer distance, but with the same kind of practical uh, detachment. Uh, I think that he went beyond the point of no return. No way that he will resume his uh, authority or legitimacy <laughs> over his people. Uh, I don't think that it's a linear process. It's now more than six months, but it's probably go going to be even a more slippery, a steeper slope, because uh, as we see, people within his security services, within his uh, armed forces, within his uh, civil service, start to assess what's going to be the end, how to hedge their personal bets about what could happen. And as a result of it, I believe that we see for the first time some cracks appearing in the support that he uh, enjoys within his own uh, arena. And it's clear to me that what happened a few weeks ago to Gaddafi and what, what might wait now uh, Saif al-Islam, his son, and even the memories of what happened ultimately to Saddam Hussein. Uh, but that's refreshing his memory that it's tough. So on one hand, it's it causing the <coughs> cracks to appear. On the other hand, it might drive him to be even more brutal. I think that the, the world response, especially the Arab League, abandoning him, King Abdallah of Jordan criticizing him publicly, uh, the way that the Turks are uh, pressing more and more, even in public, that these are real signals that uh, there is acceleration toward the end of this regime. Probably next year we won't have to have a session about Syria, I hope so. <laughs> well, interesting scenario. And if, 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 Syria, if the Assad regime does collapse, there are potentially enormous strategic benefits, are there not, for Israel, in the sense that, if you like, the, the bridge both geographically and ideologically or, or militarily towards Hezbollah is, is if not broken, yeah. is, is at least, is at least uh, blocked. Is that, is that something that you would concur with, that this is potentially not only a good in terms of humanitarian issues, but it is of potentially strategic importance to Israel, what happens in Syria? I see it's not, once again, I don't want to overemphasize our role in it. We do not have a role in it, and we are not the only ones who might benefit. First of all, the main benefactor could be the Syrian people. It's uh, 40 years that this family reigns over them like a medieval uh, fiefdom in Italy, somewhere on the mountains. It's an iron fist, extremely brutal. And uh, so it's good for the Syrian people. Secondly, it's good for the Arab world. It it's clearly might become a, a blow to the radical axis, the stretches, <laughs> what I called once the shared banana, those from uh, Tehran to South Iraq to I know, uh, Damascus to the Hezbollah holding in the Bekaa in South Lebanon. It will it will damage these, uh, these uh, uh, radical axes, and uh, they will make them somehow weaker. It will weaken the Hezbollah, it will weaken Hamas. In this regard, it's, it's good, but it's good not just for Israel. I believe it's good for the Middle East as a whole. Moving now on to the Iranian question, I want to put to you a, a set of scenarios very briefly and, and ask you to comment on them and ask what the implications are. It seems to me there, there are four kinds of scenarios. There are sort of two hopeful and two real world. The two hopeful are that we get internal regime change. Well, 
we potentially had that a couple of years yeah. ago. It's a, it's a pleasant fiction, but it's a fiction nonetheless. The second scenario is that economic sanctions really work. The problem is that Russia and China don't seem enthusiastic enough about it, to put it mildly. And also, amidst a global recession, the only meaningful sanction to take down that regime will really put it to the floor is to embargo its oil industry. Now, I'm sorry, but the concept of a $250 a barrel uh, on the oil price is not something that anybody in the Western world, let alone Russia, and well, Russia might for internal reasons, but certainly not China, would want to countenance. In other words, the economic, if, we, if we're dealing in real-world scenarios, the economic sanctions paradigm is not going to stop Iran developing nuclear weapons. So to move to the more realistic scenarios, of which I think there are two on this question, which I want to put to you. Either somebody or a group of countries launches a military strike, or we simply accept that Iran is going to get nuclear weapons and we look to containment strategies. Would you accept that that is basically where we are in the situation, that we've come to the point that either we have a military attack which at least attempts to take out Iran's nuclear program, or we have to move entirely to a different paradigm and start thinking about containment? Robin, I think you analyze better than I can. It, uh, <laughs> what can I add to it? <laughs> That's uh, said the truth. I think that Iran is a major challenge to the whole world, not just to Israel. I think that uh, the fact that Amano said what uh, El Baradei never dared to say, that his experts are seeing a continued move toward the uh, toward, uh, uh, military nuclear capability, is extremely important, not because it changed anything that the intelligence uh, communities of all of us have known for a long time, but because it made the publics aware of the nature of, of uh, this event and probably indirectly influences the position, or could influence the position of government. Uh, I think that uh, whoever sees any risks in uh, dealing more forcefully through much tougher sanctions with Iran should compare it to the situation if Iran turns nuclear and ask himself what kind of nuclear arms race will take place. Could Saudi Arabia afford not being nuclear? Could Turkey afford probably future Egypt? I don't know. So uh, that's only one part of it. Try to think of the uh, kind of uh, uh, umbrella that they will give to all the terror organizations they support from, from uh, Hamas or Hezbollah, but also I don't know any, anyone from the Lakshmi Taiba to to the uh, Houthis in Yemen or the, the bandits in Somali. Uh, try to think of the support they can, can give to others and to the effectiveness of their efforts to hegemonize the Gulf. They can much more easily try to to intimidate neighbors in the Gulf. And you might see them starting to, to hedge their bets, to, to think what should be followed. So I think it's a major threat. It's like, think of North Korea uh, producing 3.5 million barrels per day and can control or intimidate about 40% of, of world production. That would make the uh, attitude toward North Korea different. And try to think what would have happened with Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein when you came to topple him down or when you came to rescue uh, Kuwait if Saddam or Gaddafi could have credibly say that they have several crude nuclear devices. The whole uh, decision-making process would have looked totally different. Probably it was paralyzing to whoever wants to get them. So basically we are in a kind of competition between the, their attempts to reach nuclear capability and the capacity of the rest of the world through coordinated action to delay it. Because once they reach nuclear military capability, they will feel much more immune, the, the same way that Kim Jong-il now feels immune, and they can be much more brutal in closing the way or blocking the way for, uh, for any Iranian spring to, 
to emerge. I think that we should have second thought about what happened a few years ago when the Iranian streets tried to, to raise against the, the Ayatollahs with some, even some moderates, so to speak. I don't believe in a real moderates among, among uh, these Ayatollahs, but the, the less extreme Ayatollahs seem to be joining. No one responded in the world. And uh, I, yesterday night, I listened to a kind of conversation uh, here in this hotel uh, about uh, Iran. And I've heard a few Iran former Iranians and Professor Shlomo Avinari was sitting with us here. And he made a point about something that has to do with soft power, not, uh, not a physical attack. Just what could have happened if the world would approach the Iranians, following Ahmadinejad's expressions about the need to wipe uh, Israel out from map and history, you know, and what the world would, uh, how it would look like if the world would treat him the way that he treats even Yanukovych in, uh, I don't know, somewhere in Eastern Europe, okay. where he became isolated and kind of pushed to the corner by everyone. He cannot join any, any respectful gathering of, of uh, governments. I think that that's something very profound in it, because it tells that the world has a lot to do that had not yet been even tested uh, before we come to a moment of thinking what uh, should be done. And I, I think we in Israel, we, are, we do think that nuclear Iran is unacceptable. We think that we should be as the rest of the world, determined to prevent them from turning nuclear, and that all options should not be removed uh, off the table. Now, the two first expressions were statements that were created by the world community and are repeated once and again uh, by leaders all around the world. The third one, we coined it, but it's now adapted well around the whole world with the leaders of, all the leaders of the world repeated. So, the main uh, test will come when the moment comes to not to let it uh, turn nuclear. And uh, I hope that some force majeure will intervene. I will be glad to see uh, sanctions working effectively. It should be much more determined, focused, urgent, and crippling in order to really pose a, a real choice to the Iranian leadership. But I hope that it will amount to this. If not, we will have to have another interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, ju just to preempt the question that will have to be asked in that other interview, um, le let's be absolutely clear, and, and nobody wants to, to, uh, to, to be trite or to, or to ask clever questions that that you are, always are that uh, you ask clever questions without uh, <laughs> paying attention to it. Oh, well, but there's, there's a British sense of a clever question where you kind of try and uh, be a little oh. bit too clever, clever. Yeah. But um, no, but seriously, let's let's just be absolutely 100% clear about this. You are saying it is unacceptable, which doesn't just mean you don't uh, want it I, to happen. I quote the previous and the present American administration, sure. from both sides of the. That said what uh, President Bush said. I just quoted the. Uh, Literally, and uh, Obama says the same, and I believe that uh, both uh, the previous British government, the present one, says it. Both the previous, uh, the French and the administration, the new one. I never heard the new Italian uh, banker what he says, but Berlusconi <laughs> was extremely <laughs> clear about it. So I basically quoting the world. Sure. World leadership about it. Well, everyone's saying it's unacceptable. In the Israeli case, if the rest of the world will not take military action, and that is the only course that is available, will Israel take military action against Iran? I told you, we, we won't reach this point without having another interview with you. Probably I'll call you <laughs> uh, late at night, but uh, probably not here. <laughs> okay. Well, th there's another English expression. You Peter, Peter signals. Yes. The, the other Peter signals that <laughs> we have to... Saved by it. the bell. Yeah. OK. Well, thank you very much. That was a very thank illuminating you. interview. And uh, please join me in thanking the minister. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you very much.